We're really, really pleased to be talking to you today. Thank you for coming to this session. Uh, if you would have asked me two years ago, Ryan, are, how passionate are you about knowledge management? I would have looked at you and said something probably very rude and inappropriate. Because let's face it, knowledge management has to be one of the least sexy topics on the surface, right? Knowledge management, what, I mean, what do you picture? A card catalog, the Dewey Decimal System? Right. Let me tell you what, though, over the last two years, I have not only developed an appreciation, but I truly have developed a fire for knowledge management and what that can do for your business. Uh, and it's exactly what Janice said. Um, all too often, like how many of us do this, right? We put together a phenomenal learning plan to answer a single business question. We spend our time on it. We spend our research budget on it. And then once we answer that business question, All of that great insight just sort of melts away into the ether. That is a terrible ROI. And world-class uh, marketing, market research organizations, we can't afford to do that. And whether you're on the client side, whether you're on the vendor side, you are handling every day millions of dollars and terabytes worth of insight. And leveraging that insight and re-leveraging it and pushing it to the absolute limit of the return on investment, that's something that I've gotten really excited about over the last two years. And I'm very pleased to be uh, sharing that out with you today. So we are Ryan and Joanna. Now, Joanna, how is it, how is it that uh, you used to work at J&J &J and now you work at MarketLogic? Well, I started out with passion for knowledge management, actually. She did. <laughs> um, and I begged Ryan to help out with this project because <clears throat> I really think that knowledge management is going to save the world and save all of our lives in, in the process. And, saving time uh, and reusing that. And so I fell in love with knowledge management so much on this project working on J&J &J, that I actually joined MarketLogic to do this full time. Gotcha. We have seats right over here, plenty of seats right up front. All right. All right. So we all know that we need knowledge management, right? Um, on average, knowledge workers spend about two hours a day searching for knowledge, actively searching for knowledge, and only 40% of the time do we find what we need. That's you, by the way, your knowledge workers, all of you. We, we know these questions. Sometimes they're just questions that are in the back of our mind. I know someone did this. Didn't we just test this? You know, if Tina was still here, she could put her finger right on it. I know it. Um, and sometimes those come as fire drills. They're your boss saying, you know, this Reddit boss here, saying, we need this right now, right now, right now and it's buried on a share drive or it's buried somewhere um, on someone's laptop that doesn't even work at your company anymore. Um, and that's what we want to avoid. Um, knowledge loss, MIT Sloan calls it a crisis. And that's a really strong word to use for, for a lack of knowledge or knowledge loss as people are leaving the company and switching around, switching brands. Um, and this quote I really love. There is no such thing as a standalone system that provides value. Integration is the word of the next decade. And I would even go further to say there's also no such thing as a standalone insight. Every insight that we create, it lives in a, in a context, and it look, lives in the, the ecosystem of all the other insights that are being created by your teams. But you know, when it comes to cr creating a knowledge management tool for your company, whether you're a big company or whether you're a small one, and just, just, uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you work for a company right now that has some type of a knowledge management tool, a receptacle for the insights that you have that can be, that can be uh, searched and found by other people? All right, for those of you who have your hands up right now, I want you to wave your hand violently, well, wildly, um, we don't want to hurt anybody, if, if you're delighted with your knowledge management tool that you have, all right? Oh, okay. I, I don't know that I would call that like wildly. I would say that e even the people who are waving, it's lukewarm. Creating knowledge management tools are hard, all right? And they're even harder to create them that stick. And the point that Joanna made earlier about these solitary tools, that's been the folly that we've found, at least at J&J, &J, because the Hive, the tool that we'll be talking to you about today, it replaced two other standalone systems. Both of them were created by our internal IT department, which Johnson & Johnson is a phenomenal world-class uh, uh, consumer uh, healthcare and pharmaceutical and medical device company. We are not an IT company, and that couldn't be more apparent in the two terrible tools that were built. They were built on a SharePoint platform, and they were the worst things ever. So 
you might know a little something about that. Um, creating these are hard, and there's so many buts, all right? Like, the first one is, oh, change management is hard, right? Even if you already have a system and it's a terrible system, well, at least you have a system, and we know how to do that, and there's a current best approach, and it's in our uh, SOP to do all this. Change management is hard, all right? We get that. Um, but let me tell you this. Like, I hope that by the end of the time that we have together today, you'll see that Changing it, making the decision to change, and going for it, and actually doing it, is worth the effort. I promise you, it is worth the effort, even though it is hard, and I acknowledge that it is. Um, second is, how many of you work in a decentralized organization? Anybody work in a decentralized organization? Um, does anybody not? Like, does anybody work in an organization where when somebody, like, there's somebody at the top that says, this is now the way we'll do something, and then everything just magically happens that way. If anyone does, please let me know if you're hiring, because I want to be that person up at the top. I think that would be a lot of fun, or at least be in that organization where things just happen. Um, Johnson & Johnson is not that way. We'll talk a little bit about Dud J&J structure a little bit later. But when you're building something like a knowledge management tool, especially in a decentralized uh, group, you know, if everyone isn't talking the same language, and if everybody doesn't have the same nomenclature for things, and if some people want to do this, some people don't want to do this. It's very, very, very hard. That's a big but. That's a big but. And in decentralized organizations, there are a lot of big buts. Um, poof, oh, you know how sometimes th see, things seem like the best idea when there's funding for them, right? But then when times get tough, oh, I've lost interest in that, or oh, we've had a management change. Now instead of you know, in investing in this uh, knowledge management infrastructure, let's funnel all of our money into uh, you know, above the line media buys. Things, you know, a knowledge management suite, doing it right, it does take time and it does take commitment. And unfortunately, lots of times, you know, in the organizations where we work, people's attention span and people's patience, sometimes it's hard to keep them corralled and keep their eyes on the prize. Um, there's a perception that doing this right is a money pit, right? And why in the world would I throw money at an infrastructure tool when there are unanswered business questions that I have today that I need to go and put, that, put those research dollars against answering these questions? You know what? It is expensive, all right? Yeah, it is, of course it is, right? It is an investment. But chances are probably 30 to 40% of the business questions that you have or that your clients have, you probably already know a lot of those answers today. You just don't know where to find it. Um, Tina left the company, right? So it's like a library burnt down, all right? She had everything on her laptop. What a shame. What a shame to lose all of that stuff. It's, it is an investment, but trust me, what we found at J&J &J is the bigger money pit was throwing our research budgets away on answering questions that we already knew the answer to. Or at least we, we knew the majority of it, and we answered the big business question when if we could have better leveraged our tools, we could have zeroed in and only answered what was really necessary. So I want to talk to you today about the hive. Um, that's, that's what we built. Now, but first, a little bit about Johnson & Johnson. Um, J this, is, uh, this is from our website. Uh, so Johnson & Johnson has more than 250 companies located in 60 countries around the world. Our family of companies is organized into several different businesses, consumer, healthcare, medical devices, pharmaceuticals. Okay, read it this way. We're decentralized and we're complex, okay? So if anyone can, if anyone can relate to it being in a decentralized and complex organization, we would get along very well. This, uh, <laughs> this presentation is uh, targeted to you. Um, J&J was formed, it's three different sectors. There is a consumer sector, there is a pharmaceutical sector, there is a medical devices sector. Those three sectors do not interact whatsoever from a business perspective. They come together at CEO level, all right? So there is absolutely no, uh, no connective tissue between them. The uh, global businesses uh, sit in New Brunswick, New Jersey. The regional businesses sit out in the regions. There is very little connective tissue. The company uh, was uh, formed and uh, has grown primarily via acquisition. So, uh, you know, there are lots of little pockets of uh, isolated cultures. This is how we do things. We always did them at Pfizer. We always did them when we were Animas. We always did them when we were Warner Lambert. You know how that goes, right? Uh, even though we're all uh, called Johnson & Johnson today. Let me tell you a story. Uh, when I started, I was uh, 
I was working on uh, the return of children's Tylenol and children's Motrin back to the market. Uh, we, were, uh, we were subject to a FDA recall in 2009. I sit in Fort Washington, Pennsylvania, 40 miles up the I-95 corridor in Skillman, New Jersey. That's where the uh, Johnson's Baby people sat. And a couple miles up the road in New Brunswick, New Jersey, that's where like the Band-Aid people uh, sit. But we had no formal or informal ways of talking to each other and understanding what do we know about the consumers and the marketplace that we serve. So the consumer target for children's Tylenol, mothers of kids age zero to six. Consumer target for Johnson's baby, mothers of children age zero to six. Primary consumer target for Band-Aid, mothers of children age zero to six. We had no idea what we knew about each other. We didn't know what was on their learning plan. We didn't know, so what we, what we were doing is we were asking and answering the same business questions over and over and over, and none of our suppliers chose to let us in on the secret <laughs> that we were getting charged for the same stuff over and over and over again. Um, so that's 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 what the, that's what we were facing uh, when when we when we started to when we started to build the hive. I just want to do my little plug for it really has to be an end-to-end -end solution. When we were designing the Hive, we thought it's going to be great to get all these insights, all these studies into one single place, but how are we going to keep it fresh? How are we going to make sure that people are using it? There was all of those buts that we were trying to address, and what we found is if we're going to build this system, if we really are going to do it right, it has to be both the research management part and also the knowledge management part. And they have to come together, and that's the only way that the insights are gonna stay fresh, that's the only way of forcing people to use it, and we'll talk a little bit more step by step of what the steps are to get there, but really we need to focus on research and knowledge management together, end to end. And I'll tell you, um, that point was almost lost on me early on in the process, um, but if you think about this, Remember the point that we made about the standalone system? Standalone systems never work. So if, if you have a knowledge management platform in your company right now that sits by itself and that you have to depend on market researchers like yourself being good corporate citizens and that at the end of a study, you take the time to upload all of those assets into your knowledge management platform, um, because everyone's going to do that, right? And they're going, to up, they're going to find their screeners and they're going to find their questionnaires and upload them and do your abstracts and all that kind of stuff so that people can see your great work. How many of you actually have the time to do that? I don't. When one study ends, I got five more that are screaming for my attention. So Joanna's point is such an important one, all right? The tool that you use to procure your market research also should be the tool that you have to leverage and re-leverage your research. That's the only way that you can guarantee 100% efficiency between what you learn as a company and what you're able to leverage. So if you have a standalone, um, if you have a standalone knowledge management tool today that you're using, it's probably not getting the type of play that it could if it was, if, if it was constantly being fed fresh insight from all of the activities that you're doing. I can't overemphasize that point. So the Hive. Uh, Hive stands for Human Insight Virtual Exchange, by the way. It was a backronym. Uh, we had the idea to call it the Hive, but our senior leadership was like, well, what does the Hive mean? I don't want to see all kinds of like, um, you know, uh, honeybees and Winnie the Poohs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's, that, that wouldn't really fit into our, into our corporate template. So the backronym uh, uh, happened, uh, Human Insight Virtual Exchange. It's a great fit for us uh, because our uh, CMO, Allison Lewis, the first thing that she said to us when she came to J&J &J from Coke is she said, the big ideas come from the deep human insights. So we wanted to, we wanted to uh, capitalize on that connection. We launched in January 2015. As J&J &J consumer, the consumer sectors, uh, research management, and uh, knowledge management system. So we replaced, as I said, a very cumbersome internal system. It took three months. Uh, a lot of people ask me that right away. How long did it take you to do this? From the time that we decided we were going to do this, and when we opened up the purchase order with uh, MarketLogic, our partner on this one, it was three solid months of work um, to, the time, to the time that we launched. Um, to do that, we had dedicated people on our side. We had dedicated people on their side. We didn't think it, we didn't think it could happen. Uh, we said, you're crazy. They said, no, trust us. Three months, we can do this. We did. Uh, we came in on time and on budget. It did take three solid months, though, full time. <laughs> it, it, was, it, it was solid. It was solid. I, 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 I won't lie on that one. Um, the, um, 
so what is the Hive? So the Hive at J&J, &J, um, it is a brand. It's one of the brands that we have uh, in J&J. &J. It's an internal brand. Uh, the Hive is a noun. It is J&J &J Consumers Human Insight Virtual Exchange. It's the first place that we direct people to come when they have a business question. Um, all of our market researchers across the consumer sector uh, have been trained that when their business partners come to them with a business question, um, the standard boilerplate answer is, so someone comes up to me, do we have any data on blah, 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 blah? Have you checked the hive? All right, that is the first question that is asked. And until the answer to that question is yes, our market researchers do not engage in the business question. Because chances are, looking in the hive, doing a search of the hive, 30 to 40% of those business questions can be completely answered, and the rest of them can probably be partially answered, and can be, uh, and, you know, the, the true knowledge gaps are what we can, what we can address. It is an intelligent, full-text searchable database of our entire consumer, shopper, and digital knowledge estate. We'll get to some numbers in a minute. So using it in a sentence as a noun, I found everything I need in the hive. Uh, hive is also a verb at J&J. &J. Uh, we use it as a verb. So uh, to hive, uh, the infinitive would be to hive, is to perform a one-click search in the hive. So that is to smartly leverage our existing knowledge to answer our future business questions and to ensure that those big human insights that we've learned travel across the organization in an efficient way. Example, Rosa hived our concept library to see examples of compelling benefit uh, statements in her need state across the globe. So we use it as both a uh, noun and a verb in the organization. It has become part of the lexicon. It's become part of the culture of J&J &J consumer and beyond. Uh, we were just absolutely sick of asking the questions. That's, that's why we did this. Does anyone ever feel like this? Did we ever test this? Surely we've done research on. You have to go all around to do this circuitous route. Maybe you don't even know who to ask the questions. We were just sick and tired of that model. That's why we invested in building this. So now, with one-click search, it really is as easy as doing a Google search. Everybody at J&J &J has access to the knowledge estate. This made a few of our legacy market research leaders uncomfortable. Well, wait a minute. I should be the gatekeeper to consumer insight, right? Because only I can interpret all of this information. And these stupid marketers that we have, if I give them immediate access to, you know, unfettered to what we know about our consumers, they'll go make terrible decisions. That is old school stinking thinking, all right? And Frankly, I mean this with all due respect, if that's how you feel about your current knowledge state today, take a look, at, take a look in the mirror, all right? Because you're the one that built knowledge assets that people can't take off the shelf and leverage. <laughs> so that's a shame, all right? It's a real shame. As market researchers, we shouldn't have to be intermediaries with the insights that we develop. We shouldn't have to do that. All right? what, we, what we deliver to the organization should be able to be standalone, leveraged to answer the business question, and re-leveraged the house down uh, until every single possible use of that data happens. Now, should we be consultants? Absolutely yes. Should we be able to help um, you know, drive people in the right direction? Sure. But, uh, I do not feel like I have to be an intermediary um, for the knowledge assets that myself or my organization creates. They should be able to stand alone. So I'd like to show just, this is a very, very short video uh, that introduces the key functionality of the Hive. Uh, the two people that you'll uh, see in the video besides myself, um, this was the launch video that uh, we launched out to the, uh, to the multifunctionals with. Um, you'll see Allison Lewis, who is our uh, Chief Marketing Officer, and you'll also see Brenda Armstead, who is uh, the leader of our Consumer Insights Function Emeritus. Uh, those are, so those are the two senior leaders that you'll see in the video. The Hive gives you insight like never before. We're knowledge sharing real time and we have access to what's happening all over the world. And so everybody has access to information even outside of the current category in which they work. The Hive is J&J Consumers' Human Insight Virtual Exchange. It's our new knowledge management and knowledge exchange system. So here we are at the Hive homepage, and front and center is the search bar. Say you want to understand how moms interact with social media. Very quickly, a lot of documents pop up. It's great to see we have so much in our knowledge estate about social media moms. 
My results are organized by findings, documents, studies, concepts, and media. From the Hive, you can preview a document and quickly download it. And you can look at the specific project where that document came from. But if you want the quickest way to access our knowledge, you can go straight to the findings. Findings are standalone statements taken directly from study summaries. Findings can be sorted and filtered to help you zero in and answer your business question. And you can easily download anything you need. Looking for results from a concept test? The Hive contains J&J Consumer's entire Basie's concept library. One click displays a dashboard with key study information. The concept board is tested and the factors of success grid. You can download just the concept board, the results, or access full study materials as needed. The Hive is also a great place to find historical copy and see how it's scored. The Hive contains J&J Consumer's entire Millward Brown Link Library. A dashboard presents key study information along with the Link 9 box results grid. You can even watch the test spot right in the Hive or download it to your computer. So the expectation with the new tool is that people use the tool. We know that once people get using it, they will love it and they will not be able to live without it. And that's the Hive, your human insight virtual exchange. All right, so let's dig in and talk about how to actually get there. Because we talked at the beginning, there's a lot of buts. We're going to lay out exactly what you need to do to start creating your knowledge management system. So step one, decide to get it done. You cannot afford not to. I just look, um, you really, I mean, we talked about this before, stop spending all of your time, weeks and weeks, relearning what your company might already know. Identify true learning gaps. Ignite your business partners. Market research is not just valuable to market research and marketers. Engage procurement, engage finance. What can they learn? Engage R&D. Um, and then quantify also both the consequences of not building this and also um, what, it would, what it would give you, right? So let's look at the consequences of staying stagnant, continuing to waste time, continuing to waste money. And I'll tell you, um, it was three months from start to finish when we actually decided to do this, but we did fart around for six months, um, just you know, thinking about, well, are we going to do this or not, and which partner are we going to use, and all that stuff. But once, once we actually took the decision to do it, it was three months from start to finish. Um, and the, the key data point that we used with our senior leadership was quantifying, um, quantifying the opportunity cost. We said, um, and this bared out to be true, um, J&J Consumer runs about 1,200 market research studies per year around the globe, 1,200. And across the uh, four regions that we have and across the four major categories uh, or need states that we have, is about 1,200. If we don't run six studies, all right, if leveraging and re-leveraging our knowledge estate means we run six fewer studies, so instead of running 1,200 market research studies, we run 1,194. All right. The hive will pay for itself in year one. That's, that's what the investment was, and that was that key number um, that, uh, that helped our senior leadership really engage in this. You just save six studies per year. Out of 1,200, that's a pretty good ROI. Once we decided to get started, this was it. Unearth every piece of your existing knowledge estate. This was this was hard work, um, and what we did is we appointed knowledge architects to scour the planet, all right, to boil the ocean, finding the historical knowledge estate. You couldn't believe where all of this stuff was stored, if we could find it at all. There were all these isolated share points that uh, one person might still have the password for, everyone else has left the company, so we had to have IT, like, you know, custom, uh, custom export from SharePoint sites that we found. We did have two knowledge management uh, systems already that there was selective and spotty compliance with. We really leaned heavily on our supplier partners too, especially our longstanding suppliers who had been doing work with us for years. Um, you know, to say, hey, hey, Nielsen, um, we have found uh, from the last 10 years, we found, uh, we found 200 concept tests. How many have we really run? Oh, we've really run 800? Okay, all right, can you, can, you help us, uh, can you help us with that last 600, getting them in? And they did. 
And also remember that uh, insights don't just come from our market research studies. Um, we, found lots of, we found lots of stuff to uh, put into the system and made it searchable that were from things like category assessments, um, uh, various shopper information that came through. If uh, we were looking at the white space opportunities, there might not have been an actual market research study associated with it, but you know, lots of, lots of work gets done. Lots of uh, leverageable and releverageable insights come from more than just market research studies. This was a dedicated, uh, dedicated piece of work that was done um, to make sure that when we launched and people did do searches in the hive, they actually got results. Oh, yeah, um, and uh, just, I have some numbers for you here. So we launched, you remember from the video, those findings, those are things, uh, those are standalone statements that are extracted from the documents so that, you know, you can absolutely, like, answer the business question just by looking at the sentence versus having to go through a 100-slide deck. We launched with 14,244 of those from uh, 25,600 documents from 12,096 market research studies. Between January 15th and today, uh, you can see what we've added. We're uh, over 28,000 of those custom findings right now. So you type in uh, social media mom. Used to uh, pull 32 of them, I think, in the video. Now 184 come up, which is pretty cool. Um, documents, we've taken that up to 31,600 and uh, from 17,000 studies. So you can see, you know, running about 1,200 studies per year, we really, did, we really did shake the trees to find the historical knowledge estate to make sure that we launch strong. And what's great to see is because it is both our study management, we do all of our uh, engagement with our suppliers through the hive as well. So 100% efficiency comes through. The studies that we run make it into the hive because they're born in the hive. Yep, exactly. Um, step three, make it mandatory, really mandatory. And that goes back to what Ryan was just saying about doing the whole process in the system. It's really important that people are forced a little bit to use it. Of course, the search is going to be incredible. People are going to start finding what they need, and they're going to want to use it. We also may, may need to make sure that we have the stick as well as the carrot. Um, so shut down all other ways of doing research. Work with your suppliers to say, do not work unless your RFP comes from the hive. Some of our clients even um, don't pay out the final PO until the study is uploaded to ensure that we're really getting everything and sealing in all of the insights into one single place so that people can find it. Um, and that's where your maximum Im impact comes from. Of course, we all want a repository. We see the value. That value is obvious. But unless it stays fresh, it's not going to continue to be valuable. So it's really important that it's mandatory. Um, right now in J&J, &J, we have a lot of people using it, 100% of consumer market research. 99% um, of our market research vendors, I think there's someone in the back that um, informed us that they're not using the Hive right, today. Yeah, yeah, that's Shantae Applegate from Research Now. Shantae, Shantae, are you in the audience? Shantae, okay. We're going to have some is. personal training following this session. She's the last holdout. <laughs> Sounds like some heads will roll. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, cross enterprise market research, over the last year, we have rolled out to more than just consumers. So, market researchers from medical devices, from pharma are starting to use it. And also, our cross functional partners, we've seen an enormous amount of users in RD, in consumer science, in marketing, all these people that really do want to know what's happening. Who are you talking to? What insights are you getting from the marketplace? Um, and, and they're really interested in using the Hive as well. Oh, as you know, in addition to our approvers and our internal regulatory folks, we need those people as well. And they contribute to helping make it mandatory because all of the process, all of the approval flows that happen in order to get a research study off the ground, all of that is rolled into the process. Mm -hmm. Average number of logins per day for our market researchers is 5.6. Um, so the market research community is in the Hive almost all day because it is where they are doing work. Um, and it's also where they are doing searches to uh, make sure that what, uh, you know, that they're not relearning uh, what we already know. And we get about, on average, 200 multifunctional uh, logins per month as well from our marketing and our R&D counterparts. Um, speaking to the point of making it mandatory, really, really mandatory, um, improve your existing processes where possible. So if you have a current approach, 
excuse me, there we go. If you have a current um, approach, lay out your end-to-end -end technical and administrative process of what it takes to get research done in your company. What does it take to actually get a project off the ground and done? All of the approvals that need to happen, all of the documentation that needs to happen, all of the uh, engagements either with your customer or with your vendor. What all does it take? Get that out there. Actually map it out on a wall. Um, and then for each one of the steps in there, ask yourself the question, is this really necessary? Do I have to do this? Is this something that I must do or is this something that we've just kind of done uh, all along the way? And we're in a heavily regula regulated environment, uh, working in consumer healthcare. And so, you know, we had a lot of things that if you ask the question once, uh, you know, our regulatory and safety staff would say, well, yes, that's very important from a regulatory and safety perspective that you file this document with us that says this and this and this. Show me the regulation printed on FDA letterhead or whatever the ruling regulatory body is. And if you cannot produce that, then we're not going to put it in our process, all right? You clearly don't need it. Um, we were very, very tough on that. Um, so where you can, improve the process. But be careful for the unicorns, all right? If there's this new process that's around the corner, so maybe we should wait before we put together our research management process. Maybe we should wait on that um, until the new process comes. Don't wait for it, all right? New processes are always around the corner. Do it now. And just because someone says it's coming in three months, it's probably coming in three years. So just do it now. Um, the Hive solved some problems that it didn't have to, uh, but it did. So when we launched, uh, for market researchers, we cut the average time for our internal approvals by 75%. All of that uh, legal and regulatory stuff that uh, we were tripping over, each, tripping over ourselves in order to get our approvals, it was taking an average of six weeks for us to get our butts in gear internally before we could start field work. That has nothing to do with the supplier engagement and writing questionnaires and doing screeners and all that stuff. That was just our internal garbage. But doing what we did, laying out the process end to end and solving the problem, we got that down from six weeks to a week at launch. Now what's it running at? Two days. Two days, all right? So six weeks to two days in a year and a half. Um, for procurement, this was the first time that our procurement folks had 100% transparency into who are all the market research vendors that y'all are using anyway? And one of the nice things about the system is at the end of every study, the uh, study director, the market researcher, um, there's a rating scale system on how did this, how did this piece of work go? And so those rating systems are actively being used right now in negotiating the contracts with our vendors for the next year. Vendors that are getting high ratings, we want to give you more business, all right? And vendors that are getting lower ratings um, in the system, what's going on? How can, we, how can we improve this relationship? It's actively being used. For business leadership, uh, we introduced a budget, uh, budget tracking tool. And so not only do we put in this year's work as it's happening, but we also chart out what next year's learning plans are going to look like so that uh, budget decisions can be made based on the actual need and not just uh, internal exercise on, well, who gets what money for next year? And then our marketing partners, like we talked about earlier, it has democratized access to the insights. So, you know, as a market researcher, excuse me, as a market researcher, um, I'm not on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They'd like me to be, but I'm not, right? Um, I work in the, in the Eastern time zone. But the Hive is open 24-7, so you can do those Hive searches anywhere, anytime. Yep, step five. This is a little bit controversial, I know, definitely with the regions, but we do want to minimize uh, customization across your business. If we're really running a global process that's going to be leveraged across all of your sectors, across all of your regions, we want to make sure that all of those regional nuances don't make it in. We want to make sure that we're all speaking the same language, working towards the same thing, and getting to a system that everyone can leverage equally. This doesn't mean that you can't do um, research in the way that you want, use the methodologies that you want. That is still very important, but the language and the kind of the taxonomy and the way that research is talked about, that's what we want to make sure is standardized so that people can leverage it. You know, half of our organization calls them A and U's, the other half calls them U and A's. What are you going to call it in the system? All right, decide that before you build it. <laughs> that's really so that was, a, that was a folly that we had that we wish we would have done differently. 
Treat your tool like a brand. Um, you saw, you saw uh, you know, some of our launch materials, the launch video. You see, uh, you see the, the logo work uh, that was done. Um, we do treat the Hive as one of our brands. It has a brand book. It has a brand guidelines, just like any of our, any of our brands do for packaging. Um, give it a visual ID. Give it a personality. Give it its own tone of voice. Don't make it a cult of personality of the people who are working on it. All right? Let it be its own. Let it be its own tool. Let it be its own voice. Um, because some of the people that you have working on your tool, maybe everybody loves. Maybe some of the people you have working on the tool, everybody hates. All right? So give it its own. Give it its own branding. Give it its own uh, point of view and tone of voice. But draw upon the look, tone, and feel of your, of your company and organization. Make it feel like it's a part of your ecosystem. Don't make it feel like it's some, something external coming in. Make it just feel like it's, it's always been there. Um, and then build the back office infrastructure in as much as possible so that it plays nicely with your other systems. One of the things that uh, really helped us out at launch was the Hive launched. No separate passwords are needed. It uses our, it uses our single sign-on system. So the Hive knows if you're a J&J &J employee. It knows if you're coming in from the intranet. It knows who you are so that then um, you know, it, can, it can display what's most important for you when you come in. Here's some just a visual identity examples. So for Johnson & Johnson, we built the Hive. Um, the color scheme that you see there uh, is our J&J consumer color scheme. So it looks like something that was homegrown, even though it wasn't. Um, I really love what Mondelez did with, uh, with their, their installation of the market logic software. They call it iConnect. Looks like it belongs at Mondelez, right? You know, even the little you know, thing at the end of the M is inside the O. Yeah, really cool. And uh, where are my Hallmark folks in the room? Um, Hallmark, love this name, right? Uh, Hallmark launched with Hoogle. Isn't that nice? <laughs> I think that's kind of a cool thing. Looks like it fits right in, right? Looks, it looks very, looks very Hallmark-ish. Yeah, and then make it a system that people really want to interact with. We, we talked about making it mandatory, but also we want to pull people in and make sure that it is something that they want to use. Use design thinking in the way that you're approaching the interface design. Market Logic does a lot of work thinking about the process and the way that people got, are guided through um, both the process piece and the search piece, but make sure that you're pulling that in as well. Leverage your senior leaderships, have them be engaged, sending out emails, sending out reminders, asking people, have you hived that today? Um, and then surprise and delight with functionality. I've seen people do really, really fascinating things with especially the search. I mean, there's fascinating ways that you can use the libraries. Have a typing tool library, have a screener library, and say, here's the, the bank of questions that we always screen for when you're talking about chronic pain. Here's the, you know, the typing tools. Here's the, the KPI libraries that we have for all of our, our concept tests. Those kinds of things will draw people in and make them come back again and again to the search experience. Speaking of coming back again and again, Communicate fresh content early and often. This is our final, this is our final um, uh, recommendation for you as you're, as you're looking at building this. And build the systems that you need in order to communicate fresh content early and often. Um, the system cannot feel stale. Right? If it feels stale, if it feels static, then it's going to, it's going to lose interest. Um, right? You don't check Facebook if like, you don't think that there's any new posts on your news feed. Right? Got to be got to be a constant source of fresh content here. Showcase success. Um, this was something that was very important to us. Um, yes, all of the insights, all the market research studies that we've done are available. But what's also important is to show what was the business impact of those. All right, how was this insight leveraged in a new and different way in order to build the business in a new and different way? Um, what uh, you know, what we had for the first year. Um, is we had a content editor um, to curate the news feed. So as, uh, as you know, new news came in, we had a dedicated, dedicated um, contractor, uh, and he was a recent college grad, he wasn't that expensive, to actually go through and see what was new, what was being published, and find out what's going on here. Um, and it really, helped, it really helped when we launched out to the multifunctionals for it to feel fresh, to keep it fresh, to keep it going. Um, otherwise, you know, like I said, you don't check your Facebook wall if you don't think there's anything new there. So it constantly kept, felt like things are happening, things are going. Right now it's taking on a life of its own. We no longer need that resource. So a few actual use cases, um, and then we welcome your questions. Um, so this was, uh, this was a, a case study that uh, happened across our different sectors. Like I said, you remember the three different sectors, no connective tissue until you get up to the CEO. Now that we have the hive, it's a different story. So uh, Janssen, which is our pharmaceutical branch, um, they, were looking, they were doing uh, research on a drug regimen for lung cancer treatment, but they didn't really know much about quitting smoking. 
In the consumer sector, we have the brand Nicorette outside of the USA. And so we know a lot about smoking cessation, what it takes uh, to quit. So that Janssen researcher was able to pull all the studies done on smoking cessation in less than five minutes, as well as download and send a one-page report to the team. That's another thing that the Hive will do. Um, it, will, uh, it will pull all of those uh, findings that we talked about into a one-page Word document. It's ready to send, uh, send out to your team. That saved $120,000 uh, because the Janssen team was going to do some um, immersions on what it took to quit smoking. Instead of spending 120 grand on it and six months to do those immersions and to cultivate all of it together, it was a five-minute exercise thanks to the Hive. Um, a, uh, across the consumer segment, we uh, were looking to do some dedicated work with African-American and uh, Hispanic uh, shoppers. Right? It was a, a, key, a key initiative with one of our retailer partners. Now, each category had done some separate need state work, but there wasn't any like, you know, big, you know, big dedicated uh, cross, you know, cross category work done with these affinity targets in the last five years. Researcher was able to access all of the quant results of those need gap uh, studies, as well as the qual that fed into it, as well as the video uh, assets from those quals. Put together an amazing comprehensive insight book. Took, it took her a week's time uh, to do that versus $180,000 and a three-month commitment to do it. it. Took her a week. It was all there. We had the answers. Like Johnson & Johnson already knew these things about African-American and Hispanic consumers. It was just a matter of packaging them together. And then finally, understanding what your true knowledge gaps are. Um, the Visine brand was looking to uh, harmonize their global campaign and their global offerings. It had uh, grown up in seven different companies, and it looked like seven different brands, honestly, across the different markets. And no global research had been done because there was no global team. It was the first time there ever was a global Visine team to do this work. So the researcher was able to consolidate the consumer understanding from those seven markets. That was part of the historical uh, insights that were uh, you know, vacuumed into the hive for launch. They were all in there. And then assemble a what works guide for uh, media, for, uh, for creating the new global campaign, and also look at the uh, concept library of all of the different product concepts that were tested across those seven different markets over the last 10 years. So instead of starting at zero, the learning plan for, these glo for the global campaign and for the global innovation plan was able to concentrate on the real knowledge gaps. So that saved $350,000. This was me. I was the Visine researcher. I had uh, RFPs in the amount of $350,000 and a nine-month learning plan that I still had to do some work, but I was able to concentrate on the little things I didn't know versus relearning what all those regions already knew. We're at, we're at the end of our time. Um, so we welcome your questions. What I do want to be respectful of is I want to be respectful of the, uh, of the next uh, presenters that are in the room. So Joanna and I are happy to join you just outside. Uh, we'd love to meet you. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to uh, hear, hear your stories about what you're doing with knowledge management and what you'd like to do. And we thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.